I have a lot to do today <laughs> because we have to do all the dimensions um, and then start operator theory. <laughs> so it's all okay. <laughs> okay. So um, let's go ahead and um, take any questions you have about uh, your homework or anything that you just turned in. Anything, anything leftovers? Okay. All right, so um, we are working on finite dimensional space and all the good things that finite dimensional space is going to have. And the first, and we have this lemma. Let's just go back to finite dimensional space. And we have this lemma um, 2.4-1. Actually, well, it, you, you let x1 through xn be any linearly independent set. In a vector, in a uh, normed vector space, x of any dimension, then there exists some positive number which depends on the linearly independent set that you chose, such that. If I take the, the, such that for any scalars alpha 1 through alpha n, so the point is that c is going to be independent of the scalars, um, the, the norm of the linear combination, summation alpha j, xj, is greater than that constant times the sum of the absolute values, sorry, sum of the absolute values of the constants. Okay, and we gave an example last time as a statement of the lemma. We gave an example last time where we computed the largest possible C, where we took um, the actual space X just to be this uh, space of pairs. Okay, and you're supposed to do a problem like that in your homework as well. Okay, so have a look at that. It's, it's just that... Uh, business says, so how do you prove this business? Let's prove for n equal to 2 because the general case of n will be very similar. So how, how will I do that? Okay, proof by contradiction. Assume that C does not exist. And so what I'm going to do is take uh, some scalars. And we're, I said already we can reduce to the case where the sum of the alphas assume without loss of generality that um, by replacing alpha j by beta j equals alpha j divided by the sum alpha 1 plus and so on plus alpha n, which he called s in the book, but I don't need to name it here, okay, that um, star that um, that the original that star is equivalent to Michael um, this double star summation for all beta 1 through beta n so that uh, with beta 1 plus and so on plus beta n 
equal to 1. There holds double star. The norm summation beta j x j greater than or equal to c times beta 1 plus and so on plus beta n. Okay, so I haven't gone to n equal to 2 yet. But I'm, I'm just doing the first thing that I needed to do, and that is by scaling. Okay, if I, if I divide either side of this inequality by a scalar, obviously uh, this, that, that scalar could go into the alphas, okay, by scaling. So by divide each side by a positive number. So that's what I do. I divide each side by this positive number, the sum of the alphas. Obviously, if the sum of the alphas is equal to zero, the result is trivial. Okay, you can work with any c. So I don't work with that. That's a special case. So I just divide both sides, and then I get beta j. So the original equation is equivalent to this. And so now I'm going to take n equal to two and beta one plus beta two equal to one. So now consider. So assume. Now that n equals to 2 and beta 1 plus beta 2 is equal to 1. Okay. So I'm trying to prove this double star. And I'm going to assume, assume that c does not exist. Assume c greater than 0 does not exist. Okay. So therefore, there must exist um, some beta j, some beta. One, there must exist. There exists a beta one super m and a beta two super m sequences of scalars. Okay, so that um, the norm of beta. Uh, the norm of beta 1 super m x1 plus beta 2 super m x2 is going to 0. In other words, I can get the norm of the, the linear combination as small as I want. Okay, So there would, there's no c that lies below any norm of a linear combination. Okay, now what, how can that be a contradiction? Well, I've got a bunch of scalars, okay, and we said that the real numbers, we can think of them as real numbers if, you, if you're a little scared of complex numbers, okay. But we'll use the fact that the real line is complete. Um, and the fact, now also these betas must be bounded because their sum in absolute values is 1. Notice that beta 1 super m is less than equal to 1 and beta 2 super m is less than or equal to 1. So those are bounded sequences. They may be jumping all over the place, the, beta, the sequence beta 1, it may not be convergent, but it's bounded. Therefore, some subsequence converges. By completeness, a scalar field uh, well, let's see. I guess it's by the bolzano weierstrass there. Wait a second. Um, Yeah, by compactness. I'm not sorry. Not by completeness. I'm sorry. By compactness of a bounded set. I'll just say by Bolzano wire stress there. Okay. There exists a subsequence. Um, MK so that beta 1 super MK goes to some limit beta 1 as K goes to infinity. So there's a subsequence of the positive integers so that the first sequence beta 1 converges to something. Okay. And now I can take a further subsequence if necessary, and still get convergence. But I'll do that. So the now, now beta 2 
super m k now. Consider that's a sequence of numbers. That's bounded too. So again, by the bolzano weierstrass theorem, Uh, there exists this further sequence, subsequence, m sub k sub l. So beta 2 super m sub k sub l goes to beta 2. Now I'll just call that, that double, <laughs> the subsequence of a subsequence, I'll just call it m prime. That's a convenience that people call. So put m prime equals m sub k sub l for notational convenience. So I have some subsequence of the positive integers. So that both uh, of the corresponding subsequences beta 1 super m prime and beta 2 super m prime converge along that subsequence and this, there, this pair actually therefore goes to beta 1 beta 2. Okay? As pairs of complex numbers if you want. Okay. So that's what we have. So we've worked it on to that using this condition of the, that the uh, betas were bounded. Okay, and that's all I've got to check. So I've got this, I've worked myself, worked ourselves into a corner where we've got this much going on. And now what's going to happen? Well, I use the, I use the continuity of the vector space operations. Therefore, beta 1 super m prime x1 plus beta 2 super m prime x2 goes in norm, if you like, to um, beta 1 x1 plus beta 2 x2. That was by the um, continuity of the norm. Well, continuity of vector space operations plus continuity of the norm. First, I know that without the norms, it's true in my space X. Um, and then, of course, it's trivial to add the norms on there by continuity of the norm. Okay, it's a slightly different statement that with or without the norms, the convergence holds. Without the norms, I'm just saying the norm of the difference goes to zero. With the norms, I'm saying the actual norms converge. Okay, to the corresponding norm, minor thing. Uh, as we saw last time by the reverse triangle inequality. Okay, so you have this. Well, what's going on? Well, this has to go to zero by assumption in our con proof by contradiction. The left side goes to zero. But uh, beta 1 super m prime x1 plus beta 2 super m prime x2 goes to zero as a subsequence of the thing that we already assumed went to zero by assumption. Okay, in our proof by contradiction. In our proof, okay. So therefore, that means that beta 1 x1 plus beta 2 x2 is zero. Okay, now the only way that can happen by what? By property n2 of the norm, n2 says the only way that can be zero is if the vector itself under the norm is zero. So beta 1 x1 plus beta 2 x2 is equal to zero. Okay. Now that means that uh, both betas must be zero by linear independence. Is that a problem? Okay, this is the zero vector, if you like. Okay, theta, if I want to remember it's the zero vector. Okay. Is that a problem that the uh, beta 1 equal beta 2 equal to zero? Well, yes, it is, because I go back to vector space, uh, continuity of the norm or whatever there, because, because beta 1 super m prime in norm plus beta 2 super m prime in norm 
Okay, that's equal to 1 for every m prime. But this would converge, in norm, again, by a convergence of the norm, to norm beta 1 plus norm beta 2. Again, by continuity of norm. This time with the norm in the scalar field. Okay. So, therefore, beta 1 plus beta 2 in absolute time is equal to 1. Well, that's a contradiction. Right? You can't have beta 1 beta 2 equal to 0, and beta 1 plus beta 2 in absolute value equal to 1. I mean, sum equal to 1. It's a contradiction. Okay. From this and this. Okay. <laughs> okay. That's the contradiction. Okay. So it's a little, you have to throw in a lot of stuff, okay, to get the proof, but it's, it's pretty straightforward. So using the Bolzano Weierstrass property that a bounded sequence in R or C will have a convergent subsequence. That's essentially uh, the fact that the compact sets of R or C are just the closed and bounded ones, okay. So we're using compactness of, the, of closed and bounded sets of the scalar field here roughly equivalent to the Bolzano wire stress there, which is in your appendix of the book. Okay? And what we'll do is then we'll get uh, the compactness criterion for any finite dimensional uh, space. Okay, norm space. Any finite dimensional norm space will be compacted. Actually, I mean, the whole space won't be. Any uh, subset of a finite dimensional norm space will be compact, if and only if close and bounded. That's going to be the, the good or the, the standard result. But as the author states, you're going to see uh, that the infinite dimensional norm space, a closed and bounded subset of a truly infinite dimensional norm space won't be compact. At least uh, the, the closed unit ball, for example, won't be compact. So let's get to that. I know that's sounding like, I need to write it down. Okay, so what's the first um, corollary? So here it is, 2.4-2. Uh, you can read in your book if you like, completeness. Um, every finite dimensional norm space is complete. What's the proof? How will I do that? I need to run a Cauchy sequence and prove that the Cauchy sequence converges. So that, um, first I'm going to, but to be careful, I'm going to do this for n equal to 2. So assume, uh, assume again uh, dimension, let's call the norm space x. Dimension of x is equal to 2, just to make it simple. And I'm going to take uh, so the notation doesn't get too cumbersome, in other words. Take, it's not necessary to do that. I just don't want to have summation on J all over the place. I hate all those summation signs. <laughs> okay? <laughs> all right. So, and the general proof is in your book. So take uh, E1, E2 to be a basis of X even though we usually reserve E1, E2 to be the standard unit basis of R2, here he's going to generalize a little bit, okay? So it's not necessarily the standard unit, the standard basis, all right? And let YM, uh, we don't use the curly brackets in this course, I forgot, for a sequence, that YM be a Cauchy sequence. Oops. Cauchy sequence in X. Okay. Must show that YM converges. Or to show. All right. All right. Well, I can obviously illustrate, you know, represent YM, and again, in terms of these coordinates, 
uh, using scalars. So I can write each y, each y in the vector, each vector in the vector space in terms of the basis. So I'm going to write it as a linear combination. Write y sub m equals alpha 1 super m e1 plus alpha 2 super m e2. Okay. And what I want to note is that what does a Cauchy condition imply? All right. Since ym is Cauchy, okay, since ym is Cauchy, what I need to do is, um, what, I, what I'm going to do is let epsilon be greater than zero first. So sneak in before I do that. Let epsilon be greater than zero. There's always an epsilon in these <laughs> things. And what I want to show is basically that the, the alphas themselves are Cauchy. And therefore, because the, um, the scalar field is complete itself, we mentioned earlier, then the alpha, the alpha uh, 1m is going to converge, and the alpha 2m is going to converge, and then we're done. Again, lemma 2.4 will give us that it actually these scalars sequences are Cauchy. So it's going to be an immediate corollary once we get the setup. So I'm going to need, the epsilon is going to be my epsilon for the Cauchy condition for the alphas. Since y is Cauchy itself, um, uh, we have, there exists a capital N so that if um, little n and little m are greater than or equal to capital N, then, I'm sorry, I should not use the, um, he used little r because n was a dimension, but it doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, did I use n for a dimension before? I didn't in this proof, so it doesn't matter. Okay. All right. Then, okay. He's using r instead of n because n was his dimension. Here, I don't care. <laughs> okay, because I didn't mention n. Then, yn minus ym is less than or equal to what I'm going to do is I'm going to make it even smaller. C was a small number, presumably, in the lemma 241, so less than, uh, less than or equal to C. Well, I'll put less than less than C epsilon, okay? And that, it's going to make a whole lot of difference, less than C epsilon, okay? Where C, where C equals C sub E1, E2 is greater than zero by lemma 241, okay? And therefore, you have C epsilon. Uh, bigger than the norm yn minus ym, which now I'm going to write yn minus ym in terms of these alphas, okay, equal to the norm alpha 1 super n minus alpha super m e1 plus alpha 2 super n minus alpha 2 super m. It's just a little bit of writing down e2, a little bit of linear algebra. Okay, and then, then use the lemma, which is greater than, uh, did I do this? Um, yeah, greater than or equal to C, I can write it this way, C times um, absolute value sign alpha 1 super M minus alpha 1 super well, n and m plus alpha 2 super n minus alpha 2 super m. You can save a little bit of work if you play with the, the c's right, which I did in the notes. But now divide both sides by c. <coughs> divide both sides by c. which is greater than zero, okay? And you have that epsilon bigger than alpha one super n minus alpha one super m plus alpha two super n minus alpha two super m in absolute value. Therefore, in particular, each sequence is Cauchy. Therefore, with the same capital N. Therefore, alpha one super m is Cauchy and 
alpha 2 super m is Cauchy. Hence, alpha 1 super m, I don't even have to go to a subsequence or anything. This, which I can't, of course, in this proof, because I need to show the original sequence y is itself convergent. No subsequence is allowed. So alpha 1 super m goes to alpha 1. Alpha 2 super m goes to alpha 2 by completeness of the scalar field. of scalars. So, by the continuity of the vector space operations, we're done. Okay, so alpha 1 super m e1 plus, that's ym, ym equals alpha 1 super m plus alpha 2 super m e2 goes to alpha 1 e1 plus alpha 2 e2 Okay, which is in X. Okay, some point Y in X, and therefore we have convergence. Okay? So I'm using the, the fact that uh, the, the little lemma that I mentioned last time that, that I have the scalars. This, this, this scalar times this E goes to alpha 1 E1. All right, this scalar times E2 goes to alpha 2 E2. I said if I had two sequence of vectors going to some fixed vectors, and if I added them, they go to some fixed, the, the corresponding sum. So I'm using two of those properties from the, from the lemma from last time. I don't know if you remember that, that whole business. I have to draw the PDF file back up, uh, which is a little bit hard right here. So it's it's the um, I refer you to the for the continuity of the vector space operations I refer you again to problem 2.3 problem 2.2 point which one was it I thought it was 2.3. Where were the problems? 2.3.4, I say. I was missing the wrong problem. Okay, 2.3.4. Yes. I guess it was 2.3.5 that I'm actually using more applying. 2.3.5. That's the problem. So we worked that problem out last time. Okay, that's the completeness. All right, so let's get a corollary of that. Okay, so every finite dimension norm space is complete. Okay, now let's go back to um, closed subsets. Okay. Oh, uh, it's not, not close up. Yeah, but closed subspaces of a of a norm space. So if I take any, uh, let's say, uh, polynomials of degree less than or equal to five in C zero one, polynomials of degree less than or equal to five, that's a subspace of dimension six, I guess, because you have to have the constants as one of the dimensions, the first power, second power, third power, fourth power, and fifth power. So you have a finite dimensional subspace of an infinite dimensional norm vector space. What we'll say is that finite dimensional subspace is closed now, which means that if I take that, that it's its own closure, okay? So the polynomial is a degree at most five. If you close it, you don't get anything more. Okay, you can't somehow get a limit outside those polynomials in the norm defined in C01, the max norm. Okay, that makes that uh, a norm space. We don't even need completeness. We don't even need the Bonnach space here. Okay, so this is the statement 2.4 dash 3. Every finite dimensional. <coughs> So 
subspace of a norm space x of any dimension is closed. And we have seen examples, I gave, I gave the same example with the polynomials, only take all polynomials. That is not closed in C01. So you need the finite, the finite dimensions is necessary. We gave that counterexample in, in passing last time. Okay, proof. Again, just the technique of working with closed and all that business. The proof is very short. Okay, Okay. we'll call the subspace M. Even though sometimes M is going to be a subset, here it's going to be a subspace, so it's actually a vector space in its own right. Okay, so unfortunately M will not always just be a little bounded thing. Okay, this is an unbounded set. Okay, That's, we'll live with that, okay. So, so to keep in mind what it really what this statement really means is is the is these polynomials example I'm thinking. Okay? You can you can get limits outside the polynomials, you get e to the t by the Taylor series for e to the t. Alright. But you can't get such a monster if if you restrict the number the, the, the degree of the polynomial, okay? To be less than or equal to a certain number. Okay. So let x in m bar, okay? So let x be an element of the closure to show x is in m. Okay, that's all I need to do. That's the structure of the proof. <laughs> so if I let x be an m bar, since x is an m bar, there exists a sequence xn in m with xn going to x. So I have a convergent sequence to x. Um, if it's convergent, then it's Cauchy, right? But what am I going to use here about m? m itself is a finite dimensional norm space. Therefore, it's complete by the previous thing. So that, that's going to be it, and therefore x is going to have to be an m. Since xn is convergent, xn is Cauchy automatically, okay, and since m is complete by 2, 4, 2, we have that um, xn is convergent to a point in M. I don't name that point, but obviously that point has to be x. Limits are unique, okay? Since limits are unique, There's only one norm here, okay? Uh, X belongs to M, okay? Okay, X belongs to M. So, it's that, that structure of that proof is quite uh, small. <laughs> Just give the completeness. Questions about this or? So in the notes then I, I mentioned this infinite dimensional vector subspace of a norm space need not be closed. And the same example, counterexample, uh, actually, um, I don't know if he mentions the one that I mentioned here in 2.4, so if I just mention that in the reading, that's, um, yes, two point, right after 2.4.4, dash 3, right at the bottom of page 74, he mentions this, and he says that um, the, span, the, 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 the space of polynomials is not closed in C01, and he asks why, but he doesn't say anything about it, because 
at this point, he, he doesn't assume you know a lot about uniform convergence. He, all right, so he's asking the instructor really to fill that gap, if the instructor so chooses, I guess, but it almost has to. Uh, I can leave that open. Okay, so we should construct some other examples too. Um, oh, I must make that a uh, take home test problem. <laughs> okay. Now, um, so what's an equivalent norm? We're going to get into that. We have to talk about equivalent norms. You'll hear this mathematician say, you know, maybe you've heard it many times already in the past, well, all norms on a finite dimensional spaces are equivalent. You say, well, that's easy because all norms are equivalent. What are they talking about? Okay, <laughs> here it is. I need a definition. Um, let norm sub zero and norm. He doesn't like to get into a whole bunch of subscripting in this book. He likes to keep it all in context. So this is the one place he actually does, introduces a different norm, and he calls it sub zero. Occasionally he uses sub one in order to differentiate between norms as well. But he doesn't. He doesn't have a whole slew of subscripting. I think that was a wise choice. All right. Here he just says sub zero and 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 he adds the norm. Be two different norms. And here I might as well talk about um, a finite dimensional vector space because that's all I'm going to talk about on a finite dimensional vector space. Okay. Then these norms are equivalent in the following sense. There exist positive constants A and B so that for every uh, vector in your vector space, uh, there holds that um, A times the zero norm of X is less than or equal to the norm of X is less than or equal to B times the zero norm of X. So the norms are within constant multiples of one another. Notice that you could rewrite this by some different constants to put the norm sub zero in the middle. So if I take, I want to put the norm sub zero in the middle, so I put the one over B over there, and I get one over B X less than or equal to the norm X zero, okay? And then I get, I want to put, um, x0 in the middle and then x on the right, so I put the 1 over a here and I get some other stuff. Okay? So this is equivalent to um, 1 over b uh, x less than or equal to x sub 0 less than or equal to 1 over a x, like that. Okay? So, in other words, the two norms are within constant multiples if, if it's so with one version and it's so with the other. All right, so that's all that's being discussed here. Okay? So, how do you prove that? Well, you basically lose, use the lemma again. Okay? So, let's try it with n equal to 2. Okay? Proof for n equal to 2. Again, let E1, E2 be a basis for X. Write X 
out in terms of, I don't know why he used the alphas in this case, but he does because he's going to refer back to lemma 241. All right. I think he's, he, it's a little bit of a respite from the Xs. He, the Xs are going to come back soon enough. Okay. <laughs> All right. So he's going to write x equals alpha 1 e1 plus alpha 2 e2. Sometimes you wonder, wonder why he uses the alphas instead of the Xs. But here we have it. Okay. Okay, by lemma 241, there exists, I'm going to call it this time C0 greater than 0, so that when I compare the 0 norm of x with the sum of the absolute values of alphas, I get norm of x greater than or equal to C sub 0, mm -hmm. alpha 1 absolute value plus alpha 2 absolute value. That's what we had. Okay, so I can divide by C0, or the norm of x divided by C0 is greater than or equal to the sum of the absolute values. There's a little bit of getting the constants on the right, uh, on, on the correct side here that I'm going to want to do. So I have this one. I'm going to put that in a box. Okay. So can, I know there's not a lot of space on this page to sort of show what's going on. I need to show this. I need to show one of these inequalities. And so what am I going to do? I've got this on the one hand. Okay. On the other hand, what can I write about norm of x in general? The norm of x, by using the triangle inequality, I get another business. On the other hand, by triangle inequality, You have the norm of x equal to the norm of alpha 1 e1 plus alpha 2 e2 is less than or equal to alpha 1 norm e1 plus using, I'm using triangle inequality plus scaling, alpha 2 norm e2. So first I break it into a sum of two things and then scale out the scalars with the absolute value signs. Okay. Now, what you can do is, is kind of a trivial inequality. You take the max of these two norms here. There's just, there are only finally many of these basis vectors. You just take the max. That's some number. Okay? So then this is less than or equal to alpha 1 plus alpha 2 times k. k is the max. I'll call that k sub 1, I guess. But k equals the max k sub 1 equals the max of E1 norm and E2 norm. The reason I call it k sub 1 um, is that I'm thinking of this the other norm as the 1 norm. So if you want to think about it that, the 0 norm and the 1 norm. Okay? He didn't do so in the book, but... Uh, so this is supposed to be a curly bracket here. Okay. <laughs> And there was another curly bracket on this side. Okay? So that's the um, other inequality. Now if I divide by K1, so what do I get? So therefore I have, on the other hand, I have norm of X divided by K1 less than or equal to alpha 1 plus alpha 2. Okay. So if I put those two together, then I put alpha 1 plus alpha 2 in the middle, um, I should have had a zero on this original one because that's what I was using. I was using the zero norm. Did I not do that correctly? I think I had it in the notes right, but there was supposed to be a zero here. So notes, this is the zero here. So I'm using, on the one hand, I'm using lemma 240 with the zero norm. And on the other hand, I'm using um, triangle inequality with the other norm. So I have two different norms here I'm playing with. But the, some of the absolute values is in the middle. And that's kind of the, the game, okay? So then I have that, um, therefore, x, the norm, of, the zero norm of x over c0 is greater than or equal to alpha 1 plus alpha 2, which is greater than or equal to the other norm divided by k1. And so that gives us the one inequality that I want. And obviously now I can switch the roles 
of the zero norm and the other norm and get some other constants, C1 and K0. And so just do the whole thing again. Also, therefore, X norm divided by C1 is greater or equal to alpha 1 plus alpha 2 is greater or equal to the zero norm of X divided by K0, where C1 um, is associated to the original norm in lemma 241. And K0 is the max of the zero norm of E1 and E2. Okay? C1 in lemma 241 with norm. Okay? Okay. Okay. So then put everything together and you get the job done. Okay? So you get an A and a B. What is the A? <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see. I've got the B is K1 over C0, it looks like. B equals K1 over C0, and the A is equal to um, C1 over K0. Work. Okay. All right. So there's a little bit more detail in the book. Okay. Questions? It sort of seems it's just sort of like a computation there. All right. So the all so that's a pretty powerful little lemma then with that. Okay. So what's an example? Okay. Let's let's see some ex specific example. QED over here. Let's have an example now where I'll just take um, x again equals pairs of scalars. x equals c1, c2. I'm going to take two different norms. I'm going to take the Euclidean norm as one of the norms. I'll take, nor I will put the subscript in now. I'll take norm x2 is the uh, norm of the pair c1, c2 sub 2 is the Euclidean norm equals the square root of the sum of the squares. Here I put absolute values on the c's in case I had um, complex numbers. I think in the notes I didn't put the absolute value sign. So I was really thinking of real numbers. Okay? But what have you. You just have to be a little bit careful if you, know, if you want to bring in the complex numbers. Okay? And, and what I'll take for the x1 norm, I'm simply going to take the sum of the absolute values. Okay. So what, um, how are these norms equivalent? Show directly, without using the lemma that I've just proved. <laughs> Show equivalence of norms directly. So in many common situations, you don't really need this fancy lemma. We'll use the lemma again later, though. So, but let's just see, just to uh, review against some more topics that we're supposed to know. <laughs> what is, uh, let's see, what could I do? Uh, first, um, first, let's see if I can get something simple. I claim that the... 2 norm is less or equal to the 1 norm. I claim that the square root thing is less or equal to the sum of the absolute values. Is that obvious? First, the square root C1 squared plus C2 squared is less than or equal to C1 plus C2. Okay. Is that obvious? Square both sides. And you get extra terms on the right. Right? Obvious by squaring both sides. Now you might wonder, what is the right, so that's the constant 1. Okay, so I have x2, so I'm putting x2 in the middle, so I have x2 less than or equal to the norm of x1. Now I want to get greater or equal to question mark. 
Okay? Now I want to get it greater than or equal to something. Now what what can I do? So a claim and then then so this the exercise is actually to establish the claim. So I'll tell you what an answer is, okay? So I claim that one over the square root of two norm x1 no, the, the one norm is less or equal to the norm x2 uh, excuse me the norm of x with the norm 2 okay the 2 norm of x claim that uh, this is true so this is with n equal to 2 right and in general, in general, with n tuples, okay, I'll have 1 over the square root of n, x1 less than or equal to x2. Okay. Now, that's pretty standard, but how do you do it? Well, I tried working it out the long way in dimensions n equals 2 and 3 by um, brute force. And you'll see that in the notes. But there's a fancy way to do it. I don't want to go to the brute force because it takes too long. There's a fancy way to do it. Anybody have an idea about that? I need to show that, I need to show, so to show, let's say with n equal to 2, to show that um, c1 plus c2 is less or equal to, sometimes the general case is better than the uh, sometimes the general case is, has more intuition than the um, specific case in this so or, or c1 plus and so on plus cn less or equal to the square root of n times the square root of c1 squared plus and so on, plus cn squared. Where does that come from? What did you have in linear algebra? Wasn't there some kind of linear algebra thing where you talked about the uh, norm of an inner product, excuse me, the absolute value of an inner product, absolute value of inner products in terms of the uh, product of the norms defined by that inner product? That's something that you'll actually see in section um, 3.2. It's called the Schwartz inequality. But there they've done it in general. But it's a, it's a totally general fact about inner product spaces. Okay, which what you had. Rn, for example, inner product space. Cn. With a different inner product, slightly different. But there it is. It's called the Schwartz inequality on page 137. Recall Schwartz inequality. Or sometimes Cauchy Schwartz. I was going to ask a different quote. Cauchy Schwartz was less general because they, they call it the Schwartz inequality in linear two. I don't know why that. That's a bunch of junk. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's just the Cauchy Schwartz. Yeah. Okay. Okay. It's not anything special. All right. <laughs> Cauchy Schwartz inequality, page one thirty-seven. Okay. Then. So what that gives, if I if I do this explicitly, I can write C1 times 1 plus and so on plus Cn times 1. So in other words, take the vector that has the n, vec the, the n vector that's all coordinates are 1 as one of the vectors, and the other vector as the absolute values C1 through Cn. All right, and so consider that. The Cauchy-Schwarz inequality said that the, the inner product... Uh, x, y, an absolute value was less than or equal to the norm of x times the norm of y. Now you might wonder what where the norm here, where this norm, I should call that um, sub 2, sub 2 here. That's really the 2 norm, where the 2 norm of x is defined to be equal to the square root of the inner product of the thing with itself. Okay? That's important 
that we're talking about the the two norm there. Or otherwise, the cauchy schwartz inequality doesn't apply. So what I'm getting, so the norm on page 137 is really the, the norm defined by the inner product. Okay, it's important. It's not just any old norm. Not just any old norm, but it's this two norm. Okay. So therefore, I have this. This is the inner product in the usual Euclidean space. Okay. Therefore, this in it doesn't even need an absolute sign. It's already positive. So this is in Rn. Okay, if you like. Inner product. Rn. I don't even need Cn here. Okay. Then I have that this. Yeah. Let's see if I. Oops. Sorry. Just an ordinary eraser that'll work. Okay. Inner product in Rn here. Okay. So that's less than or equal to what's the 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 two norm, therefore, of one through one times the two norm of absolute value, C one through C N. Okay. Which in ordinary square root signs is <laughs> the square root of 1 squared plus and so on plus 1 squared times the square root of C1 squared plus and so on plus Cn squared, which is equal to the square root of n times the 2 norm of x. <laughs> okay. Which is what I wanted to show. So there's the inequality. Cauchy Schwartz comes to the rescue in comparing. Um, the one norm and the two norm on Rn or on Cn. Okay? Okay. Comments about that? Or questions about that? So that's reviewing the Cauchy Schwartz inequality. Um, the proof of the Cauchy Schwartz inequality is the same in your linear algebra text as it is here. Okay, on page 137. It's always the same. Okie dokie. So that's our example. Compactness now. I, wanted, uh, I have about 10 minutes or so to, to talk about compactness and about negative minutes to talk about linear operators. <laughs> but I might have to uh, save a little bit of that for the next discussion. Okay. So compactness. Definition. But as be a metric space. So I'm going to generalize slightly here to a metric space. So I have the distance, and it's not necessarily by a norm. And then M, a subset of X, is compact. If, here's how he's going to do it. Um, if as if re, as regarded as a metric space by itself, okay, I, uh, this is really bad. Okay, I, I'm going to erase so a little bit. Erase. Sorry, I'm going to erase this, this the way I started here. It's important. It's important to be a little bit careful with the definition. Okay, so I'm going to say let M be some subset of X, period, okay? Then M itself may be regarded as a metric space. It's just a set of points with a metric on it with the same metric. It's called a metric subspace of X. It's just called, in the case of metric space, it's just some subset. It will automatically be a metric space. It doesn't have to have any vector space properties or anything. It's just a clump of points inside your original metric space with the same metric. It is come, M is compact <coughs> metric space in its own right. So what I'm going to define is compact metric space, and that's enough. Any subset will be compact if if the subset itself regarded as a metric space is a compact metric space. So 
So all I'm doing is defining compact metric space in the end. Does everybody sort of see the game that's being played there? So in order, I don't have to talk about uh, definition of sub sets of compact spaces. I just have to take, talk the definition of compact metric space. Because I'm going to, any subset I'm just going to regard as a metric space. It's on the right. It's a metric space in its own right if what? And this is also, the author has a footnote about this, about this definition. All right? Definition, if for every sequence xn in M, there is a convergent subsequence. X sub n sub k goes to some x in M. For every in M, there's a convergent subsequence. Of course, it's a different subsequence each time. So, in other words, it's not always the same n sub k's. All right? There's just there exists some subsequence. I hope that's clear enough. That's called sequential compactness. But that's the definition that we need in this course. Okay. And I think I gave an example of a metric space that's not compact. Example that I gave before. I'm not sure um, I gave it this time also. Uh, yes, I did here. Zero, one as a subset of Euclidean space is not compact. Because xn equals 1 minus 1 over n um, has no convergent let's call this m convergent subsequence in M. No convergent subsequence in M. In other words, it doesn't con uh, no subsequence converges to a point in M. Because the sequence itself wants to converge to 1. Well, will converge to 1 in the superspace. Therefore, any subsequence will also have to converge to 1 in the superspace. All right? And superspace is the same metric. There's met limits are unique. So 1 has to be the limit of any subsequence. 1's not there, okay, in M. Therefore, M is not compact. Okay. The lemma is that if the um, in any metric space, automatically a compact excuse me any compact metric space must automatically be closed and bounded. Okay, so let's put it this way. Let's put it this way. If if x now I am going to consider the superspace. So this is the lemma. If x because normally we do have a superspace for these compact sets. Okay, if X is a metric space in its own right, and M is a subset, then M is compact, all right, which means it's a compact metric space itself, implies that M is closed in X, and M is bounded. I don't have to talk about bounded in X. In, in X, it's just bounded. Remember what bounded means that the the uh, distance from any fixed point will be bounded by some positive real number. Okay, so how do you prove that? So that every compact set in a metric space must be closed and bounded. I think this was actually proved 
in your previous course, but we'll, we'll redo it here. Okay, first the boundedness. Proof one, boundedness. Suppose not. Suppose not bounded. Then, uh, for some B in M, some fixed point B in M, um, there exists a Y sub N in M with the distance between Y, N, and B. I said uh, greater than or equal to N. Okay, you can construct the sequence Yn inductively if you want. Okay. So, so you fix a point B in M, any point B. If it's not bounded, fix any. So just fix B in M. I, I don't. Then not for some B. Then fix a point B in M. Let's put it this way. I'm not trying to confuse you. Fix a point B and M. Then uh, first fix the point B and M. Then there exists Y and M with D Y N Y N to B is greater than equal to N. If it's not bounded, okay, just fix any point. Then if it's not bounded, then you can get arbitrarily far away from B. Okay, so you pick a point that's at least n away from B. Okay, now you get that point. Now you can also get n plus one away from B. Okay, <laughs> so uh, so you can just pick it directly. Okay, you don't even need to do it inductively. Okay, if however, if if it would be that that some subsequence y n k goes to y in m for some subsequence y in k then then what? then in particular the distance between then uh, the distance between y n k and y is less than or equal to one for all k greater than or equal to capital K. All right, and therefore the distance between y n k and b could not be bigger than uh, n k eventually. All right, therefore. The distance between y and k and b, all right, will be less than or equal to um, the max of the distance between y and 1 and b up to distance between y and sub capital K and b and 1, okay? It'll just be, it'll be too small, all right? for all k. All right, well, that's a finite number. Okay, so therefore, dynk b will be less than n sub k for large k. And that's a contradiction. Okay, so therefore, it has to be bounded. In other words, because I said it was compact, therefore some some sub subsequence. If it since it will be that. Okay, I should put it this way, not if it would be. Since it will be that. All right, let's put it back here. I'm sorry I messed you up on this right at the end of the time. Since it will be that. Y and for some subsequence y and k then that I can measure the distance between y and k and y less than or equal to 1 for all sufficiently large k, all right? And therefore, the distance between y and k and b will have to be small, 
Okay, I just take the maximum of all possibilities here, and then y in k to b is less or equal to 1 for all the rest of the k. So I take k less or equal to capital K and little k bigger than capital K. So two cases, and I just take all those possibilities. So there's a finite distance that can, the maximum distance could ever be away from b. And I say, well, but I already constructed it so that it gets as far away as it wants. So that's the contradiction. Okay, how do you prove? So one is proved. One, boundedness is proved. Okay, then how do you do two? How do you do closed? Closedness. Okay. That's also this really short proof. That X be an M bar. Okay. <laughs> that was the, the hard part I already did. Let X be an M bar. Okay. Where M bar is the closure in X. Okay, so there's some super metric space. I mean, some larger metric space. All right, so then I take the closure. To show, X is an M. Okay, well, we already know there exists an XN in M with XN going to X. Okay, by assumption that X was in the closure. Okay, that you always get that by automatically. Now, of course, I have, I'm assuming the compactness, so I get to take my subsequence. All right, by compactness, there exists x n k going to uh, some limit in m. Okay, well. Limits, okay, but but the subsequence will have to have the same limit as the original, okay? But limit xnk, k goes to infinity, equals limit xn, n goes to infinity, all right, equals x, okay? Therefore, x is in, which is x in m, excuse me, x in, in capital X, but this is the same argument that I was talking about with the, uh, the subsequences of 1 minus 1 over n. Okay, It would all have to go to 1. But in this case, um, x is compact, so x is in m already. Okay. So... So this argument says that the limit will both have to be x and x, but x was already in m. But x is in m already. Okay. So, huh? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, x. I, this wasn't supposed to be in m. I'm sorry, this wasn't in m already. Okay. I, I make a mistake here, but the subsequence converges to x. The, the limit in M is what I'm saying. Okay, so I have, I'm sorry, messed this up. This X was in X. Okay, but the subsequence goes to a limit in M. Okay, but the limit has to be X. Okay, so this limit is in M. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> that, is that clear enough? It's such a short circle that it's confusing up here at the board. Okay, I had a little bit wrong. Okay, so I let x be in the closure. I know there's a sequence x in the goes to x. I don't know where x is, if it's in m or not. Okay, but compactness is a sequence x, a subsequence x and k that goes to a limit in m. But that limit has to be the same limit the original sequence has. Okay, then we have a limit in m that's equal to x. Therefore, x is in m. Okay, QED. All right, that's going to have to be for today. So every compact subset of a metric space is closed and bounded. And, of course, the converse is not true. And there's the big theorem next is a subset of finite dimensional norm space is compact. Well, there's two theorems. A subset of finite dimensional norm space is compact if norm is closed and bounded. Okay, that follows pretty much what we're doing with... 
um, that, that closeness there and before. And then he has a counterexample. So I'll have to do those next time. So read up on these notes if you're going to need help on the homework this weekend, please. Hey, what's next time you next Thursday? Uh, next Thursday, yeah. So I'm a little bit behind now in terms of the, the written notes. I might have to give you a break someday. I don't know. I'm fortunate ahead, though. I'm pretty much I'm done looking at Chapter 2 practically, so um, I'm trying to keep caught up with you all. Okay. Thank you, Michael. So you join the course now? Yeah. Okay, great.